every step of the way you need to make incredible solar images. You're going to need a solar telescope, a camera, a laptop, and some software. Let's get started. First, I'm going to cover some general tips on how to get the most out of solar imaging. Then we'll get into the details on how to do it. But don't skip over this section because it's vital to the quality of your final result. Before we go any further, I'd like to ask you to click on subscribe. It really helps me with the algorithm and encourages me to keep making more content like this. Thanks. Seeing is the single most important thing that will affect your solar imaging. It's pointless to try to image the sun with poor seeing. Seeing is the term for atmospheric turbulence. Even with a completely clear sky, seeing can be poor depending upon the winds above you. Early morning before the breezes start is often the best time. This is contrary to what you might think if you're a planetary imager, because then you want the planet to be as high as possible in the sky. But by the time the sun is high in the sky, the resulting temperature gradient means the air may look clear, but will be turbulent in most cases. It's not always possible, but try to avoid observing over buildings, houses, parking lots, or other heat radiating structures. These objects tend to create a layer of bad seeing right over them. For best results, water, grass, and snow provide minimal ground turbulence in the foreground. Elevate your telescope 10 to 20 feet if possible to avoid low-level ground turbulence. High altitude is generally better as it means you're looking through less air. An ideal location would be an east-facing second-floor balcony overlooking a high-altitude lake. Seeing predictions can be found with online sources like Astrospheric, Meteo Blue, Clear Sky Charts, and Good to Stargaze. Links to these sites are provided in the video description. If there are some light breezes, wait for a moment of calm air to make a capture, or try using SharpCap's Seeing Analysis function, which I'll demonstrate later. Put your laptop in the shade. It's often best if there's a shade structure beside the telescope where you and your laptop are protected from the sun. If you can't get into the shade, you can use a laptop tent. It's very hard to see the screen in direct sunlight, and you'll need a good view of the screen to focus properly. It's very important that the pixel size of your camera you use matches the solar telescope you've got. I have a detailed separate YouTube tutorial that you should check out if you haven't done so already. A link has been provided. Set your mount for solar tracking because the sun moves at a different speed than the default setting for stars. If you're not solar tracking, the sun will soon drift out of view. If you're taking a time lapse and using an Alt As mount, unless you have a rotator in your mount, you will see field rotation issues. The sun will appear to turn during your final video. With the refractor, a Herschel wedge will produce better results than a full aperture filter. If you're using a full aperture filter, a Mylar filter usually produces better results than a glass one. Use a 7 to 10 nanometer wide, 540 nanometer green filter on your camera to improve contrast on sunspots and granules. A link for this has been provided. A word of caution, only image the sun if you have a professional full aperture solar filter, a dedicated solar telescope like a Lunt or a Coronado, a mica-based Edelon like a Quark or a Solar Spectrum, or a Herschel wedge with a refractor. A hydrogen alpha filter for bringing out the HA regions in a galaxy is not going to protect you from the sun. How do you know if there's something interesting on the sun to photograph? Use NASA's SDO site to see what the sun looks like in the last 10 minutes. This is the Solar Dynamic Observatory. You get both hydrogen alpha and broadband views. If you see an interesting prom, a sunspot group, or a filament, grab your gear and get set up. If the sun happens to be quiet at the moment, you can do other things. A link to this site is provided in the video description. You want to use the most current 64-bit version of SharpCap. Use the SER, not AVI. The capture area shows you how much of the sun you're going to see. 
if you want to zoom in on something, you can lower the capture area, which has the effect of speeding up the video capture as well. You always want your color space to be mono 16, and you want your binning set to one, unless you need more brightness with a zoomed in feature. For a full disk, you want to select a square region of interest or ROI, like 2000 by 2000 if your camera supports it. This camera does not. I can do a square ROI here at 1096 by 1096. That gives me a square image. But in my case, what I would do is I would take the largest image if I wanted to get a full solar disk and do a six panel mosaic. You want to collect 16 bit data for more clarity and luminosity changes when viewing images with high dynamic range. For example, here you can see there are some bright areas and there are some dark areas that are filaments. We want all of these to show up well, so we want to have 16-bit data. The frame rate, or the FPS, is showing here to be 62 frames per second. You want that to be as high as possible, all things be equal. It depends upon many factors, including the camera, the ROI, the exposure, the USB cable you're using, the focal length, whether you're single or double stacked, and telescope aperture. Having said that, I produced some outstanding full disk images with my IMX 533M camera at just 29 frames per second. It all depends upon the seeing and other factors. But all things being equal, a faster frame rate is better. As I've described previously, I've done a great deal of research and direct comparisons of solar cameras. For my F7 Lunt telescope, the IMX 290 and 533 cameras are a much better pixel match than my IMX 174 at F7. The 174 or the 432 are much better with a 4x Barlow at f28, or if you had a quark and an f7 refractor, the quark's got a built-in 4.2x Barlow that also takes you up to around f30. The pixel match is more important than the frames per second. In other words, I get a much better result with an IMX 533 camera at 29 frames per second than an IMX 174 camera at 63 frames per second every time. I've done detailed comparison testing with five different solar camera sensors with different combinations of F ratios, and I've verified for a fact that pixel match is vital and much more important than capture speed. You want to set your exposure to be between five and eight milliseconds to freeze turbulence. 10 milliseconds max, unless you're using a Barlow, then you can go up to 15 milliseconds for a full disk or perhaps 12 milliseconds for close-ups. Note that if you've got a double stack system and you're imaging a prominence, you can remove one etalon and get a significantly brighter image, meaning you can reduce your exposure time and or gain. You lose some surface detail, but if the objective is the prom, it's worth considering. With my Lunt telescope at F7, the best pixel match camera among the cameras I own is a Mars M IMX 290 camera. But with this camera, I can't get the whole disk in, as you can see in this image. In that case, I'll take six overlapping captures and create a mosaic later in Affinity Photo. That's usually how I get my highest resolution disk images. I'll show how to do that later. Here are some maximum acquisition duration suggestions for a 100 millimeter scope. Full disk, two minutes. White light solar granulation, 60 seconds. Proms, 40 seconds. Spicules, 30 seconds. You want to decrease those times for a larger aperture or increase them for smaller apertures. In general, less time is better if you want to freeze movement on the sun. You want to set the offset here to be at least five to protect detail and darker areas of the image. If you're using a Barlow, you can increase the offset to 15. There's some confusion about the need for a UV IR cut filter. If you have a Lunt or a Coronado or other pressure tuned system, it's unnecessary since the Edelon pre-filters out UV IR. Adding such a filter to a LUNT simply adds another reflection surface. If you're using a quark, then a UVIR filter on the camera is helpful. You want to set your histogram here to be 55 to 80%. If your image is mostly uniform brightness, like a prom or a filament, you can be higher. If you have a lot of brightness variations, like I do in this one, I should make it lower. So what I should be doing here is lowering the analog gain a bit what that's going to do is it's going to prevent me from blowing out these brighter areas. You'll see that if my gain is too high, these bright areas are overexposed and the histogram is off the edge. I can lower the histogram by reducing the gain. And here I am at roughly 100%. 
these white areas are still a bit overexposed. I want to lower it further and pull this histogram back to the left a bit more. And now we can see we still have detail in the darker filaments, but we retain now some clarity inside the brighter areas around the active regions around the sunspots. So you want to be sure that your histogram is between 65% and 80% roughly, depending upon the brightness variation on the surface of the sun where you're taking the picture. You can also use the histogram slider to find proms on the limb. So if you go over here, for example, I know there are some proms that are now invisible, but if I grab this slider and pull it to the left, they suddenly appear. Don't worry if the proper exposure makes the prominence as hard to see on your screen. I show you how to make them pop out with IMPPG in my post-processing video. A link is provided in the notes. If you want to try to measure the seeing, you can use one of the tools in SharpCap called the Seeing Monitor. You should get a red box, which you can move around, and you can also change the size of with your mouse. What you want to do is you want to include several areas that have some high contrast features like a filament or a sunspot group. Then you can press reset and see what seeing you have. Average seeing is around three. Poor seeing would be 1.5. Very good seeing would be over 10. So you can see it's kind of an average day for me here with my seeing. Now, what I can do is I can set my seeing monitor to control the capture of the image. So rather than just capturing 2000 frames in a row, what I can say is let's capture, for example, the 1000 frames that are above. Let's click here, for example, and I'll say start. Now watch down here, I've captured 100, I've dropped 28. You can move these thresholds. See what actually happened just now is the seeing improved after I started it. So I can press my mouse in the center again. I can do this several times throughout the capture. I want to keep it around the middle, basically. And then you'll see that you're capturing and dropping frames. Once you get to 1,000, you'll have the 1,000 frames that were best seeing. You can also move this box dynamically during the capture process. So now I have the 1,000 frames that were above that level of seeing. For most photos, a 2,000 frame capture is good. What matters are two factors, the scale of the sun you are imaging and how much it's changing dynamically. So if you're imaging a full disk and there are not any particularly active prominences or sunspot regions, you can capture for a minute or two. But if you're zoomed in with high magnification on an active flowing prominence, reduce that to 500 frames or maybe less, because in more than 10 seconds, you might see blur in the final image. Optionally, you may wish to name your files. You can use a syntax that captures the exposure gain in number of frames. For example, you could say surface, 7 milliseconds, 76, 2,000 for the number of frames you captured. This is useful if you're doing a lot of imaging and you want to compare different image settings and see which ones produce the best results. You can also try a higher gain and a lower exposure, and then a lower gain and a higher exposure, such that both yield the same histogram. Then you can compare the images and see which one gives you better results. A lot of people ask me the best way to tune a pressure-tuned etalon. There are several methods. Your objective is uniform brightness across the disk with the highest possible contrast. I look at a high contrast feature, like a filament here, and I adjust the etalon to show it most clearly against the sun. I'm going to now adjust my etalons so that they are out of tune. And you'll see the difference between uneven illumination and even illumination. So now I'm adjusting one of my etalons. You can see how the lower part is getting too bright. I'm pulling it back down. Now I'm adjusting the other etalon. It's getting too dark. I want to have uniform brightness across the screen. somewhat back to where I was. It's also a good idea to recheck focus periodically because it will drift over time.
seeing is going to have a big impact on your ability to focus. When seeing is poor and the image is turbulent, it's much more difficult to nail the focus. When seeing is good to excellent, it's much easier. There are several methods. You'll find as you get experience, you can eyeball it pretty quickly. But if you're not there yet, here are some techniques. First of all, you want to reduce the exposure or the gain so you can see some surface features. If your sun is overexposed, you won't be able to see anything. For example, I move my exposure up. All I see is a blank white slate. I need to reduce this so I can see the surface detail. The first method, and the one that I use most often, is to zoom in about 250% and find a filament or a surface feature that's got some contrast. Then rock your fine focus back and forth until you get the sharpest image. The seeing today is only fair, so we're not getting a really sharp view either way. But that's about the best we can do with this method. Since I'm an experienced imager, this is what I do most times. Variation on this approach is to adjust the histogram slider to the right to create a more contrasty image. When you have a more contrasty image, it's easier to make the focus change. You can see as I'm moving the focus back and forth, going in and out of focus, there's one point where we are getting the best detail. Once you've done that, you push on this little circle and that takes you back to the normal histogram setting. A third method is to go under Tools, Focus Assistant, Contrast Edge Detection. What we want here is the highest possible number. So as I'm moving my focus out of focus, you can see the number is decreasing. As I get more back into focus, the number increases. And I want to get the highest possible number. Once I go too far, the number decreases again. So this is a numerical way that you can find the best focus. Note that focus may drift as temperature in the tube increases. After you've locked down a good focus, you should recheck and adjust every 15 to 20 minutes, especially on a warm day. What do you do if you see Newton rings? These are caused by internal reflections between optical surfaces in the imaging train. They're most noticeable at high F ratios. You don't normally see them at F7. They're also more obvious if you are out of focus. So here's a focused image with Newton rings. And now if I adjust the focus to be out of focus, you can see they're much more obvious. All right, so how are we going to mitigate these Newton rings? Newton rings can happen when you get an internal reflection between two optical surfaces, creating an interference pattern. They appear as concentric, alternating light and dark rings. One way to defeat Newton rings is to slightly tilt one side of the imaging train so that the interference effect is disrupted. But you don't want to tilt it too far or it may be difficult to retain focus across the entire image. In solar imaging, you can place a tilt device between the camera and the telescope and adjust the tilt one to three degrees until the Newton rings are minimized or eliminated. If you have Newton rings but don't have a tilter, there are a couple of ways to mitigate them. The first is to loosen the set screw on your Barlow lens. Pull the camera slightly back and tilt it left or right, taking advantage of the slight play in the connection, then retighten it when the Newton rings look better. You may have to pull the camera partly out of the Barlow connection to get it to work, so be careful that it's still well connected. The other trick you can do is take flats, which also help to reduce the appearance of Newton rings. I find it's best to deliberately be out of focus as the Newton rings are more visible then. With the fast tilter, you tighten one side while loosening the other. You'll notice the rings start to shift to one side and then broaden in thickness until with luck, they disappear completely. It's important to take flats. Flats will smooth out variations in luminosity across your image, as well as eliminate dust specks and reduce Newton rings. There are several ways to do this, including defocusing and a simple plastic bag, but I use the Daystar flat filter for consistent optical quality. First, we're going to set capture flat. 
and increase the exposure until we are roughly centered, about 50% covered, it says okay. You can really do between 15 and 30, I'll just pick 30 here, hit start, and it's going to capture, there's the status down here, 10, 11, 12 frames. Note that each set of flats is only applicable for one capture area and camera. So if you change cameras or capture area, you have to redo your flats. You want to keep the gain low and adjust your exposure to be 50% of the histogram. Note the histogram becomes more symmetric after the flat has been taken. So now that's done, I'm going to close this. And I will take this back to auto. I'm going to move my exposure back to similar one we had before. And now I'm going to take the flat cap off. Now we should see we have a much more uniform look at the sun. There are a couple of ways to increase magnification. If seeing is good, don't hesitate to use a barlow to zoom in on interesting solar features. Try to optimize the match between the camera pixel size and the Barlow as discussed in the solar camera review video. Remember also you can decrease your ROI to help you zoom in on features. Also notice that when I lowered the ROI, my capture speed increased to 120 frames per second. and set it up so I'm capturing 500 frames every 15 seconds for at least 60 minutes. My exposure is set for no more than 10 milliseconds. You can play a bit with the number of frames captured and the delay between frames, but I would not wait more than 40 seconds between captures if the sun is active and you want a smooth animation. Let's pause for a moment and talk about alignment. When you're doing visual or single photos of the sun, a basic one star alignment is all you need to get a good result. But animations require the telescope to track very consistently on a small area of the sun for an hour or more without drifting. If you're lucky enough to have an observatory or a permanent mount that is always calibrated and aligned, you're in great shape. For most of us, however, we're setting up a portable mount and literally doing a one-star alignment. Even very expensive mounts are not able to be set up in the field with just a single star alignment and achieve perfect tracking. There are several workarounds. First, you can set up the mount the night before, do a three-star alignment to ensure it's tracking well, and then park the mount so in the morning you can recover your prior stored alignment. Remember to choose solar tracking rather than sidereal tracking because the sun moves in the sky at a different speed than the other stars do. Another alternative is you can align on the sun, set your sharp cap reticule on a prominent feature like a sunspot, wait for 30 or 45 minutes, and if your mount allows it, align as your second star on the sun again. A third method is you can do your one star alignment, set your reticule on a key surface feature like a sunspot, and then basically babysit the mount and make manual adjustments as required when it drifts. This works but gets old very quickly because you're basically sitting beside your mount for over an hour making tweaks. The fourth method is to get a solar guider. I bought the high node solar guider from Astro Hutek. In my experience, so far at least, it works very well except when the sun is very close to the horizon, when the oblateness of the sun causes some drift. Even then though, it's a big improvement over no guiding. But once the sun is 20 degrees or higher in the sky, I've not had any issues at all. 
it sure saves a lot of time manually babysitting the mount. Here's a tip for double stacking. If you have a double stacked etalon, you can try rotating one of the two etalons about 75 degrees and see if that slightly improves the contrast. I find I get my best results with my double stack system when the second etalon is rotated about 75 to 90 degrees away from the first one. Be sure if you do this that you reset the etalons properly before retightening. If you follow these guidelines, you should be able to get the best possible solar captures your equipment is capable of producing. Now you'll need to dive into how to process these images. A link to do that is provided in the notes. I hope this has been helpful. Please subscribe to the channel and thanks for watching.